the, the, uh, there are two, two issues. Uh, one is uh, my, the, the language I'm using, it doesn't support that, the, uh, but uh, it, definitely that can be done. So that, and the idea was that the beacons are free running, just like they are with Loran. They're running all the time. You don't ask for location, you just, they just listen and you do it. So yes, the beacons themselves could be free running independently of the robot. And the only problem is with the only problem is choosing audible sound for that. I thought it was great for debug, and I found out it's terrible for debug because you hear it all the time. <laughs> and after a few hours, it's like, tick 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 tick. You go, Why in the world did I choose to do this? Why didn't I choose to use the infrared where I couldn't see it? I wouldn't hear it. But uh, and, and by the way, I put this in my backyard, and uh, I didn't tell my neighbors. You know, we got the, I got this eight foot fence and they can't tell what I'm doing and I, but I could hear him and his son and some other people over there and it was you know, and they're, they're fairly quiet but, tick, tick, tick. but after a while I heard them say did you hear that? <laughs> I thought I heard something, what was that? <laughs> kind of unlike anything else they'd ever heard in the environment <laughs> Once though they, you, but, but what you're getting at yeah. is, is is there some way where it can be an ongoing uh, localization for the robot and the, the problem with this approach is that you essentially need to be still in order to do the waveform averaging, if the signal-to-noise ratio was positive, and if, in other words, if the pings were for sure the loudest thing in the environment, not just one of them, but all three of them, at the position of the robot, were absolutely, say, 6 dB louder than everything else in the environment, then it should be ping, 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 done, right? And with that, the robot could be moving if you deconvolve the, uh, it's sort of an envelope, you could deconvolve where the robot is and you would anticipate where the next ping is going to be, use a Kalman filter to say I anticipated it here, it was here, I was off by a little bit, so I'm probably going this way instead of this way. Independent of that, obviously you'd have some uh, resolution. Uh, it would smear it. It would smear it. Uh, right. Uh, so basically you'd have to figure out the trajectory and calculate it, you know, just basic right. vector right. physics type of thing. Right. So that can, that absolutely can be done. It was not the intent. So this is this right. is intended to uh, calibrate. The concept. It's intended to calibrate the odometry, not to replace odometry. Right. Yep. But it could, you know, if you really ran, ran it fast enough and loud enough and, fa and processed it fast enough, you could replace the odometry. It was not my goal. Yeah. So it's your. You can do it. Okay. All right. So here's the result. Just to give you a comparison, that's the result from Now you can hear the pings, but you you know if you listen, you probably only hold, heard five or six of them. Right? But after all the processing, it's pretty clear where they are. And that's what we're going to trigger on. That's the beauty of waveform averaging. And it doesn't take a lot. So I'm just going to change the color because all my other stuff was done in blue, and then extend. Just look at one second, and now we're going to set the thresholds to figure out where these pings are. Well, setting thresholds, the traditional wisdom is, oh, just do uh, standard deviation and go two or three standard deviations away from your noise, and just trigger. It's like, duh, it's the first year, you know class and you're done. And a lot of the people I talk to is like, what's your problem? Why, why are you having a problem with this? You, you haven't characterized your signal correctly. You try to characterize it when it's the ratios are a thousand to one and, and, the, and, the, and the noises are greater than that. They're, they're all talking about things where you've got positive signal to noise. When you've got negative signal to noise, you can't just set a threshold and go with it. So, so you know, real world teaches you lessons. Anyway, here's what really bugged me. Even after I'd done all of this stuff, that was just the beginning, because what we've recorded now consists still of ambient noise. It's not all gone. Crosstalk, and the crosstalk from a nearby beacon can be louder than the actual ping emitted from a distant beacon. That was very annoying. That's due to cheap hardware. But you know, hey, I wanted to see if I could do it with cheap hardware. Getting, working around the crosstalk without, you know, working around it instead of eliminating it. Big problem. Precursors, eh, bad name. I don't know what I don't know what you call it. I'll show you in a moment. It's a filter artifact. Oh, the pings. Ah, the thing I want. And then the echoes. And you go, echoes, who cares? They're quieter than the pings. Uh-uh, they're louder than the pings. So thresholding, again, doesn't work. 
I mean, you know, this two sigma, three sigma stuff, no good. All right, so set the thresholds. Well, what I did was to set the thresholds at two times the ambient noise floor. Certainly don't want to trigger an ambient noise. And that, that's a fairly easy thing to avoid. Yes? Two times measured how? From the peak, not the RMS, but the peak of the ambient noise. So not in dB. Uh, not in dB. Okay. Well, why would it matter? Well, three, because you said, did you say twice or half? I said twice, but if okay. it was twice in dB, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that 20 dB was twice 10 dB. No, I wouldn't say that. Okay. So why'd you ask the question? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Paul Klipsch. Yeah, the units fall out. You're right. Right. No, I was, yeah. no, Paul Klipsch asked me that question. I was visiting him and trying right. to sell him something, and he just, you know, he baited me with something like that. We were showing a scales on a on a uh, on a spectrum analyzer, and he says, "Oh, 20 dB. That's twice 10 dB." And then he he's this really tall. Well, he looks like Moses. And he looked at me, and I said, "Sir, I don't think so." He's good for you because he's very intimidating. <laughs> he's very intimidating, and he was like, he was trying to see if I was just going to agree with him. And if I agreed with him, it'd be over with. Paul Clutch. Yeah, the old guy in Paul. Oh, yeah, 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 with the choo choo train and the airplane. Wow. Yeah, the big loud speaker. Yeah, but if you think mm -hmm. at an exponential scale, yeah. you might consider yes. if you're talking exponentially, it is twice. Huh? Not twice actual. I'm just talking. Okay. You're already. You're already thinking exponentially, mm -hmm. right? Well, usually with power and sound, I'm thinking yeah, exponentially. Right. So, but your question was that I, I would find the peak of this piece, this which was supposed to be quiet. If you notice, the pings were like tick, 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 silence, tick, 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 silence. That silence is there for a purpose. It allows me to auto calibrate the ambient noise instead of listening. To ambient noise and then starting the pinging. Instead, the ambient noise calculation is done ongoingly. You know, the, you don't have to calibrate for it. It's right there. It's done every quarter second. Anyways, the peak of that. And so I set the threshold to be, see that line? It, said, it actually is the first quarter second, so you might notice that that one's above it, but it's just looking at the first quarter second. It doubled that and says, okay, whatever uh, peak follows this is a candidate but then it has to do some other things because of the because of the filter artifacts and it uh, so anyway so it says there's the and I did two times because I could the the traditional approach is to do three times but that would require a better signal to noise environment so doing it two times was kind of taking a risk which seemed to work all right and if it doesn't work then you get a bogus result it says I don't know where you are and you just increase the number of pings and do it again improve the signal to noise ratio. And you could do that ongoingly in a real-time system. All right. So, and then detect where the uh, where the where the peaks are, and that those peaks are the the peak of that Haber sign. All right. And then from there, you do the math that we did in the first half, and it tells you where you are. You are at one one point six five. 4.4, 4. you are All this one, stuff one point point seven feet from I thought, the A. I thought for demonstration purposes we'd want to move the robot around and have something that would say it went here and you sort of sort of meandering around in the environment. Not a big deal. All right, that's it. So is any of this any good? Well, the pros are the resolution is as good as the sample rate. That's quarter inch, half inch, you know. But I think that's great. Uh, the, 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 again, the traditional wisdom is go, go at 200 kilohertz or 400 kilohertz and get the resolution even better for this D to A, the A to D, I mean, sorry, the D to A converter. I don't find that to be necessary, you know? That I, and also, that would be dependent upon using directional transducers, and this is supposed to be omnidirectional in order for it to work. The accuracy is extremely dependent on how accurately you tell it where the beacons are. And there's a way to calibrate that out by doing a 2D interpolation to say, I put the beacons here, and now let me put the robot here and say, and have, I will give you perfect look, uh, coordinates for the robot. Now you calculate what you, where you think it is and key that in for, say, three or four locations, and then you do a linear interpolation to flatten that out. And that allows you to get the accuracy to be arbitrarily good. So if you want 10th inch res uh, accuracy on a quarter inch resolution, go for it. You know? but that, I just didn't care about that. 
right? Repeatability was my big deal. It's got to, if it's cheap, you had to run the risk of it being jittery or random. And the repeatability was the thing I spent almost all my time on. And it does vary some. You saw that earlier, but it's only, it's only a sample or two. Okay, it uh, rejects bogus results. Like you've heard it say, I don't know where you are. It doesn't just say, you're in Denton County. It says, I don't know where you are. Because if you get the wrong angles on that stuff, the, the, the answer could be way off someplace, or even an imaginary number. So, it, so for example, you saw those three circles. If it says that the big circle has a negative radius, that's impossible. So it's, it doesn't even tell you that the robot is anywhere. It just says, I don't know, it didn't work. Try again. And it handles that large dynamic range, and it's cheap. But it's slow. You've seen how slow it is. And you've said, is there some way to speed it up? Well, a robot has to be still. So this corrects odometry. It does not replace odometry. But if we're really clever, it might be able to replace it. I don't know if I'd want to depend on it right now. It, uh, measurement errors have a huge impact on it. And what kind of impact? If you, didn't, if you set the beacons too close together, let me show you what happens. Let's say the beacons are just one foot apart, and the robot is 10 feet away. And you have a one sample error, one sample error, on the measurement of, the distance of one of those two distances like this distance and this distance, just one sample error puts you three feet away. It's like a, a marionette, the, you know, the, the, you know, the puppets, and you move a little movement here, and the marionette goes like this because the, marionette, the puppeteer is doing like this. That's, it's that kind of problem. So you can see that I put the beacons far apart. Of course, if the beacons are collinear, there's no problem. Uh, as, as opposed to triangulation. With triangulation, if the, I, I've told you about that before. I don't need to mention that. Right. Uh, system response, we talked about that already. Distortion. Distortion of the pings at the microphone is a problem because that screws up the detection of the threshold. But distortion from the, from the environment, you know, shouting and yelling and uh, distortion of, of the noises is not a problem. If the noise is distorted, it's just more noise. But if the ping is distorted, that's a problem. So pretty easy to fix, though. And uh, no two beacons are the same. You were asking about that. You know, the, to the two speakers, do they have to be matched? Not exactly, no. It helps, but it's not necessary. Uh, be aware that nothing is truly omnidirectional. So uh, one approach that was taken was that I, I put, pointed the speaker straight up, because the robot is on a, this two-dimensional plane here point it straight up so the sound coming out is, is omni, right? Yes, it is. But then, one thing, all my energy is going that way instead of going to the microphone. And the other is, for sure, the echoes are louder than the direct path sound then. And not just a hundred times louder, maybe a thousand times louder. So, I was talking to Dale about this at RVO, and it's like having a flashlight in the room, and you point the flashlight straight up to sort of give illumination of the whole room, and then you look at the flashlight, you can actually look at it. But if you point the flashlight at yourself, you know, it's uh, too bright, but you point it straight up, it's like, oh, no light, very little light coming from there to here, but a lot of light coming off the ceiling. Same sort of problem with trying to point the speaker straight up. And obstacles. This is kind of annoying, and I wish I could fix it. If the uh, reflection off the bottom of a table is pretty annoying, and that, one is, that reflection is so close to the length of the pane that it's hard to reject it. So... Still working on that problem. So. Uh, and some solutions to this is to keep the robot inside a polygon, a, some kind of regular polygon, that, that, or not doesn't have to be regular, but I mean some kind of a shape that is bounded by the, by the beacons. If you let the robot go out of here, then those hyperbolas, it's, it's like